Welcome, Achievers, to... Not an easy Achievers game podcast, really. This is something new. This is a... I don't know, an Achievers interview, something like that. We'll figure it out in post, but... I have someone special with me today. I have... Dustin Furman. Hello. How are you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic. It's been uh, a little bit of a strange day. I don't know if we want to get into this now. I was... uh, Oh, please. I I like... uh... I've been doing a lot of like game hunting stuff, and I saw a yard sale that listed it was going to have so, video games, but it's a Wednesday, and that mm, should have tipped me off mm, that it was not going to be good, yeah. but I went out anyway, and these games were at like, the worst possible condition, and also the worst games. It was like... You got some uh, grandmother uh, that's like, uh, Timmy had this. I don't know what it is. Would you like it? No, I, I, that would have been better, honestly. Oh. This was like a guy that... Uh, he just had a bunch of junk. Let's be mm. honest. It was just not worth anything. And I was like, yeah, I'm not really interested in this copy of a uh, guitar hero, Van Halen. Oh, just, <laughs> uh, oh. And, and then like a bunch of GameStop boxes, you know, with games in oh, them. Yeah. And it just, I was like, well, that was a waste of time. I used to but work at a GameStop. That, I was a manager and I, oh, every now and then okay. I have flashbacks and I go, fuck. And that that just that just gave it to me a little bit. Where like, God, those boxes, my God. Oh, yeah, but Dustin, you actually touched something that we're about to get into. Yeah, and that is you doing something on the side. But before we do that, of course, we have Dustin Farmers with today, executive producer over on Last Stand Media. If I'm correct, December 2018. Since then, uh, so yeah, I've been working for Colin since 2018. I don't, I'm, I can't remember when my role changed from editor to executive producer sometime probably when you became the one thing that runs everything so whatever point that that happened it was i think a year before we rebranded so maybe it was 2020 ish when that happened okay i don't know all after you turn 25 i'm convinced that everything just runs together and you lose all con concept of time yeah so so that happened to me i'm 20 fuck i do this every time i'm 20 uh uh seven see this is what happens i think i don't remember just 20, i'm point. pretty sure i'm 27 and it that kind of happens too where like i barely I, I barely am cognizant of the last five years like i just know it mm-hmm. happened and i think oh, covid yeah. helps too it's like what sure. has been the last three years i don't really know it's just been kind of it happened and i blinked and i'm like oh i'm I have a house and shit. It's a lot of weird stuff happened like in like three years and it just bleeds together. But this isn't about me, Dustin. This isn't about me. This is about you. I wanted to bring you on, ask some questions, really just pick your brain. Really. I, I always wanted to have this kind of interview type format for the little um, YouTube that I do on the side here. And I wanted to bring you on to just ask you some questions about the industry, some of your personal life. Things of that nature. I got you for about an hour, so we're gonna we're gonna condense right. that hour and we're gonna make it fun. Um, really cool. quickly, you already mentioned it, and I think I found it when I was researching a little bit about you. So you said you've been ha- hunting around for games and things of this nature. You started. I don't know if this is like some sort of. You said renewed interest on Twitter. I don't know if that. You know, you're just being a little, mm-hmm. uh, little put a little flavor on. But is this something that you're doing regularly? Are you at like? every few weeks going out to these flea markets or something and trying to find like collections of games. Are you trying to build up a collection? Are you just trying to get cool shit? What's up? Yeah. So I, I said renewed interest because basically probably when I was in junior high is when I started to want to collect retro games. And so throughout junior high and even some stuff in like my early twenties, Uh, On and off, I had collected retro games. And then I kind of, it kind of ebbs and flows of collecting. Like you kind of, at least for me, I like get obsessed for a little bit and then I'll forget about it for a little while and then come back. But now I'm I'm kind of back to it. And part of that is just from seeing uh, a lot of retro gaming YouTubers out there making content. And so it's funny just for me because... And I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but I'm equally inspired by people that make great work and people that make bad work. And I saw a lot of great retro game hunting YouTube channels that really inspired me. And I saw some bad ones (laughs) that also did really well on YouTube. And I was like, well, 
I want to do this anyway, and I clearly have a head start thanks to Sacred Symbols. Yeah. So why don't we just get a GoPro and, and make some videos out of it? And so, so, you, so you brought up Sacred yeah. Symbols, if I remember correctly. I don't think um I don't think Colin lets us forget. It's the number one gaming Patreon ever. Period. Right? Quite the accomplishment. Yes. Yeah. As far as Pretty public sure numbers on Patreon, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. First off, congratulations to you and Thank everyone you. over there. That is no small feat, especially when it really just started with, I mean, really kind of just you and him. Now, of course, he was right. the main driver, but I mean, I'm sure a lot of that success is due to your part as well. But um, very quick, I want to go back very quickly. You said retro, right? Mm -hmm. What's retro to you? Man. Anything? <laughs> NES? SNES? Are we talking Famicom? Are we talking Atari? So How far do we go back when Dustin is going through these dustbins so a lot of people consider retro anything that has hit 20 years old and i think that that is okay. fair yeah. to, to put that kind of definition on it for me though i'm just trying to find either games i find interesting or games from my childhood um e extending all the way up to Sometimes even Xbox 360, Wii, PlayStation 3 era, even though by most people's standards, those are not retro. So I don't know. Some people don't even consider PlayStation 2 retro or, or GameCube. Which but, I, I think is a little crazy. I, I think yeah. we're definitely at the part where PlayStation 2 is definitely retro, especially when you look at the prices of some of these fucking games. Dude, GameCube right now is insane. You can go on price charting and just check the average price of mm -hmm. GameCube games, and it is shot up. It is insane. Like, Double Dash right now is an $80 game. Whoa, uh, oh my basically, God. any mainline Nintendo uh, GameCube games are just insane. I remember uh, uh, at my time in at GameStop, one of the incredible things that I never got used to was we would sell uh, DS and 3DS games. Pokemon would be would be more than new games so like if i remember oh, correctly yeah. pokemon soul silver if they would sell that that'd be like 70 to 80 dollars and that's like oh that's cheap now yeah and that's and that that's game. that's a retailer <laughs> that's a retailer that like just throws a price on they're not like gauging the market they for games right. like, half the time just throw stuff on there but yeah you said um you said things are shooting up now is this maybe a renewed interest for everyone getting into the nostalgia period, or do you think that's mainly due to the pandemic, or is that everything? I think there's a lot of factors at play, and you can't really point to one specifically. Mm. I think some of the big ones are, you mentioned the pandemic, and so you have everyone locked inside, and they've been given thousands of dollars by their government, and everyone's just sitting around thinking about dying. So what better to do then spend your extra cash on things that you loved as a kid to help you forget about dying. That's true. So that's, that's think, true. I think that's one aspect of it. And then I think that also that there's some, uh, you know, there's YouTubers out there that have become more and more popular and have kind of made retro games cool again, mm. I guess, in a lot of ways. Okay. You like Scott the Waz. I was like, just about to ask, do you have a few huge. names? I'm, I'm kind of outside of the retro scene so i don't really know i know maddie mm. does a lot of stuff and he's super into that i watched a couple i think i watched his um i <laughs> i watched his uh final fantasy 10 video and he immediately started shitting on it and i was like fuck i thought i had someone yeah. on my side <laughs> i thought i had one fucking person like this game but uh, that didn't right. work out but uh is there a couple people you you, sh you want to shout out as like who revolutionized this kind of retro scene it started for me um, first off, I get it all from my father. He he played games like when he was growing up, and that was the NES era. And he was just mm -hmm. he would just play, play, play. Always got the newest stuff. And he hit that mark where he's like, "Oh, I I I want all my cool stuff back." So he's he's got. I think he almost has every system that he's ever nice. wanted. An NES, Atari. I think he even has the Atari. Uh, I think it's seventy two hundred. If I'm uh, if I'm not getting that incorrect, I think it is. It might be something else, but he has right. He has like almost every system he's ever wanted. So he's got all that. He's slowly buying things. He's collecting Xbox controllers. This man's wild. I love him. But mm -hmm. with the retro quanta, is there someone that you specifically want to that you say that kind of started this trail that maybe pushed you a little bit into it, too? Yeah. So, I mean, as far as like 
trailblazers of course like angry video game nerd is like the og that's, content that's creator would, when it comes to that, retro that's, but i think as as far as like a modern example of that i think scott the waz is probably the biggest and I'm, I'm not like uh i love i've watched a lot of his videos i really like his stuff i don't know if i'm like a mega fan or anything but recently some of the channels i've been watching are um retro rick and the uh what is it? It's the the NES Pursuit. Oh, Pixel Game Squad is mm. another one that they're both focused more on the the hunting aspect of okay. it. So it's almost like and this is, you know, this is really smart from a YouTube algorithm perspective is that you like have a niche uh, channels amongst a niche hobby as well. So <laughs> yeah. it's like there's Maddie's channel. And that's kind of the funny thing is that Maddie's channel, we both are doing retro gaming stuff, but we're doing it in totally different ways, which I think is totally cool okay. that you can do like these different kind of angles to something. Can you specify the angle that you, you would take and that necessarily he does? I think so. Maddie is more focused on like, Hey, let, this is a video about final fantasy 10, like you mentioned, yeah. and we're going to go through that and stuff like that for me, my videos. And I'm, I, so I only have two videos out right now. I have like one hunt video in one of my I game collection. The, and I, saw the hunt I video. just finished the edit on the next video that i'm really excited about i feel like it's way better than the other two mm, okay the, that's a little exciting yeah the um i feel like my angle is gonna is way more like the hunt the thrill of the hunt in the moment kind of like vlog style just because with sacred symbols and the other stuff i do it's so focused on talking about the games themselves and there's some of that in in the videos i've done but i really I find the hunt of going and finding a good deal and seeing something in the wild so thrilling that that's kind of what I want to portray in my videos. Ooh, okay. That's okay. I like that. Now, if we're going from retro. I think no one to bring up other than retro, of course, is Nintendo, especially when you're talking about retro games. They kind of started Definitely. everything um, when they launched the NES. And you uh, tweeted out a very interesting uh, poll that I wanted to bring up. <laughs> want to bring up that I'm not, I know you that you know what I'm talking about because I laughed mm -hmm. very hard when I saw this. Um, and you said, "Why? What makes the Switch so stinky?" Now you brought up a bunch of retro stuff. I feel like Nintendo is kind of the retro hub almost, right? What? What mm -hmm. is? What about the Switch is like? Stinky, I guess, is the best way of putting it. You put a revolting 30 frames, putrid 5, 540p, and then grody anime fans. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I must be. I think I'm one of those grody anime fans. I apologize. Me too. Well, okay. That tweet, I like to do a good tweet that some people or the majority of people are going to find really funny. Oh, yeah. And then a good amount of people, it's just going to go right over their head because yeah. a lot of people know I'm a huge Nintendo and a huge Switch fan as well. But this it, it started as a joke between me and uh my friend friend of the show of sacred symbols jimmy champagne where we were like ah oh, the stinky really really switch. quick it's like really quick it, i want to interject very yeah. quick jimmy champagne i love that we've never seen jimmy champagne and i think you brought it up in an episode i'm glad we haven't seen it i hope i never do i hope it's this this almost mythical figure on the show yeah. like a unicorn that we just never know about but we always hear about right yeah so so him and I like we the thing about the switch, too, is just that as much as we love it and like the OLED switch is really nice, it's just getting too old. Yeah. And, it you know, yeah. we've, we're now in the PS5 and Series X generation and we're we're dealing with like 4K and high frame rates. And so when you use the switch, it just uh, it's got a little bit that that stink on it. You know, we just got to that stinky switch. Come on, Nintendo. We need something new at this point if i'm playing the sequel to breath of the wild at 30 fps and 720p uh i'm still gonna be happy but in, i'm also gonna be unhappy <laughs> at the same time all right so uh doug bowser comes out he's like dustin we need help stocks going down the japanese side of nintendo is starting to breathe down on me i need help what do you recommend that's uh, nintendo do i think that nintendo is all about reinventing the wheel in a lot of ways i mean they have done follow-up consoles but they've mm. done it in a horrible way like the wii u oh so i it's a I controller it's, but a system yeah yeah <laughs> yeah exactly i think people are still enthralled or into the idea of the hybrid console very much so and i think that really 
I don't know if this if the Switch needs very much outside of like a major spec bump, along with like if you could pair it with um, some NVIDIA DLSS upscaling so you can get 1080p, 4K type resolutions on the output. I, I really don't think they need to reinvent the wheel on this because they have such a good thing going with Switch. People are into the, you know, uh, Joy-Cons are getting the the other versions that are like yep. bigger or what that. If you don't like it, there's a lot of customizability in the Switch. And so really, man, I think it's just like, and dude, the OLED screen on the new one is fantastic. Ooh, it's God. like, Ooh. they have so many it's elements. So correct. But just like, it's just too old now. We yeah, need a I don't, spec bump. I don't find myself playing it. Really, at all. Now, yeah. if I, memory serves. You have a Steam Deck, correct? I do, yeah. So, are you playing the Steam Deck as much as your other systems? Is this something that you're gravitating more towards, or is this something that's just kind of the cool thing that we all buy and you don't actually play? You just have it. So, I went real hard on Steam Deck for probably the first month and a half, two months that I had it, because I was doing a lot of traveling, Uh, During that time, I was either going down to Virginia to visit my parents and see Colin. I spent a few days at Cedar Point, stuff like that. So I was using it a lot. And then more probably about the last month or so, uh, I haven't used it very much. But that doesn't that doesn't bother me. Like, I, I don't feel like I need to use something all the time in order to feel good about my purchase, because I know that at any point I could be like, man, I want to play this game and I want to play it on deck. You know, and so then it's there for me. Also, it's like a great uh, emulation device. And so God, right now I've been we doing are like a fucking lot of simpatico on. today, brother. You we yeah. are you are coming with the the easy pivots as soon as I said. So you you mentioned ROMs, you mentioned uh, emulators. I want to bring up with Steam Deck. Mm-hmm. Have you noticed because I have ROMs and emulators have been a thing. Uh, Ten yeah 10 years or probably more than that now i don't oh, know longer than that yeah, yeah like and they've become they were always there it was almost like it was almost like the uh it's almost like a sex toy like it's there mm-hmm. everyone knows you probably have one <laughs> but you just never talk about it and sure it's become more open with the steam deck whereas there's giant creators openly making videos about hey this is my emulated steam deck these are all the games i have on it this is how easy it is, et cetera, et cetera. What do you make of the basic open talk of emulation and ROMs? Because, you know, you can argue, eh, illegal, illegal, you know, whatever. It, people will, the cops aren't coming for you, but that's not the argument that mm. I'm putting here. I'm just curious. What do you think of the kind of renewed interest in ROMs and emulations because of the Steam Deck? Well, I think that it's more than just Steam Deck that's causing people to be more interested in emulation. It has to do with the crazy prices of some of these games. Mm, For example, there is no, as far as I know, there was a little bit of debate on this on Sacred Sims. I don't remember what the outcome was, but I, to my understanding, you cannot easily and cheaply buy a copy of the original Silent Hill. Your only option. I remember this. Maybe there's one on PS3, but even then you're going to have to jump through a bunch of hoops in order to actually buy something on PlayStation 3 at this point. Right. But uh, technically PS3 is not a supported console anymore. They don't make and manufacture or sell them anymore. So that's also a hurdle if you don't have one. But there's no good way really to play that game. I know that the I am super lucky to have a copy of that game. Yeah. But I didn't when I played it initially because it's like, dude, that's like... $150 $150 to yeah. play that game. And so I think that while there is, of course, no question about its legality, I think that there are definitely uh, different individual perspectives on the morality aspect of it. Yeah. And I think that that's going to have to fall person to person. But for me, it's like, I don't know. I just simply don't care when it comes to a game that's that old and you don't give me any option to pay for it. Or if it's a game I already own, then yeah, I have no problem emulating it. Like, I think some people will feel like that's not the right way to handle it. And that's totally fine. But I, it, I don't know. This is kind of our, our thing on Sacred Symbols. It's just like, do whatever you want to do. Do what feels right to you as long as it's not like, you know, you're not killing somebody or whatever. Right. But um i don't know the emulation scene though is crazy right now like stuff that can be done with gamecube and different consoles and the steam deck like you mentioned is just 
crazy. That's how I played the original Silent Hill was on Steam Deck, and it was a fantastic experience. Okay, so, yeah, you mentioned the ROM simulators. I'm curious... Hmm. You know what? No, we're going to move from that. That's a good... That, that you, you nailed it. You nailed it. I, okay. I, I would yeah. only echo what you say. <laughs> you, you've nailed the, the ROM simulations. I've never had a problem with it. So I, I, I really, I, it's like... Um, Okay, like, uh, I think I, uh, what did I play the other day on an emulator? Uh, su uh oh, the original Suikoden, right? Mm, My dad's own company okay. or whatever. If I go yeah. and buy Suikoden 1 and play it, no, none of that money goes to the people who made it. So why is it a, I don't know, to me it's like, why is it a problem? Because, like, if I go right. and I buy all the things for that, not a single money, uh, dollar goes to, to someone who actually had a hand in doing anything with it. So uh, that's mm -hmm. where my morality kind of like stresses where I'm like, I don't, I just don't, I don't know. I just don't see an issue with it. Of course, legally, there's an issue with it, but the, the actual moral implications, as long as you're not straight up torrenting games, like within the last year, I think Kotaku got like shit on for a week, um, uh, Registered right. So, because they like said that you can uh, emulate Metroid or something on something. Mm -hmm. I was like, what the fuck? That, that happened yeah. like a year and a half ago or something. So, like, stuff like that, uh, where it's just blatant, like, yeah, don't torrent games that you can buy specifically right now. Like, that's a that's a bit much. Right. And I've seen people make that argument. that It's like, it's always morally OK to <laughs> do pirate Nintendo games. And like, no, it's oh, not. Definitely that, that's, not. And that's been a, a big part of the conversation with Steam Deck is that it's pretty dang good at emulating the switch. Yeah. And I get that. And honestly, I mean, I've never done it, but I wouldn't be opposed to if I own a Switch and I go out and I buy a copy of Metroid Dread, then I think that technically, legally, if you ripped your your copy of the game and then load it on your Steam Deck, you're not doing anything illegal. No, I don't think you could so. Just download I don't think it. that is. I it's think the, the downloading sure right. of the file that I think is kind of yeah. in a gray area. Or maybe not even gray. But that's one of those things where I wouldn't be... I wouldn't even care. I'm like, Nintendo, I gave you my money. So... You know, I I don't know. There's people that act like if a company does anything that they might consider anti-consumer, that it's suddenly OK to steal from them. Mm. And that's not cool with me. Yeah. And, and uh, to um, probably write, write a bow on, on this ROM talk, um, I found it interesting that a lot of people are even mentioning playing PS3 games on the Steam Deck. And I was like, mm, interesting. We're right, getting pretty yeah. close to that being... Uh, PS4 games. So I just thought that mm -hmm. was interesting to bring up that people are got so much more open about talking about ROMs and emulators where they never really did before, and now they're being like, "Yeah, I played a PS3 game on there." I was like, mm, "Okay, all right, no judgment yeah, here." It's crazy, dude. All right. Um, speaking with um, kind of drifting away from Nintendo and the Steam Deck a little bit. Uh, subscription services. You guys talk about it a lot. I wanted to bring it up here only because mm. yeah, this is probably. This might be, aside from China's influences in games, this might be one of the biggest things that's going on right now, right? The subscription renaissance, I guess, we could, if we want to be grand about it and talk about it. Where a year uh, where a lot of people who know their shit talking about this year, you will see growth in subscription services, but maybe not actual physical game sales. What do you see as a landscape coming in the next year to five years where a subscription service is starting to benefit the holder more than actually selling their physical games. Of course, not dollar per dollar amount, but if they're seeing full on capital gains from their subscription services over their physical games, maybe that will drive Microsoft PlayStation switch to double down even more than they already are on these subscription services. I think that there is a, happy medium and i know maybe some people listening to this as a uh a guy from a playstation podcast will think <laughs> that i'm uh, uh being a fanboy here or something but i really do think that sony's approach from a um industry health perspective is is better in that they are able to make their huge triple a games and sell them for full price and the subscription makes more sense for um smaller titles maybe at launch you know we just saw stray on the playstation subscription or um back catalog stuff and i don't know it's one of those things where 
I'm like I'm a Game Pass subscriber and I Me currently too. have the PlayStation subscription and mm-hmm. I don't know if I'll keep it, but it was only twenty dollars to upgrade for till the end of my thing. So I was like, cool, whatever, I'll do that. So I think that just the the problem right now with Game Pass is just that they're the the first party content is just not there for it. And I think that they're experiencing like a major lull. And then the stuff they are releasing is not always doing so well. I think that, I mean, we've talked about this on sacred, but like halo, halo infinite, infinite like, staring into the abyss. <laughs> oh, it hurts me so it hurts. bad. It really as does. A big halo fan. I, it's like very deeply frustrating and upset, upsetting to me because I love that series. I love that IP. And I even love, halo infinite at first like i love what Mm. the core of that game is but they've just completely fumbled it and i don't know i'm kind of getting away from the subscription service no 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 no. i I think but i think microsoft's the one that i mean i think anyone's bringing that up right because they've been Mm. at it longer and they've put more ball uh more eggs in this subscription basket they already said every first party game is coming to game pass and that's mm-hmm. that's a full stop sentence. There is no but or if or like if it's a first party, it will be on their subscription service. So I feel like that is one of the things where you bring up where, yeah, that's that's kind of the one that we have because that's the one that's the longest. And also that's the one that's kind of. Could be a future representation of what the gaming landscape looks like. I want to quickly bring up since you brought up Microsoft. The landscape being since Halo Infinite has been such a dud. And it's pretty clear that, and I am an Xbox fan, just just to give you like a background, that we yeah. aren't getting anything <laughs> this year, uh, as far as first party goes. That's I think that's pretty clear, uh, with Redfall and um, Starfield being delayed. It's almost uh, upsetting to talk about, and I want to quickly get because I don't think you, I feel like you don't talk about Xbox a lot, obviously because you're on PlayStation podcast, but sure. with yeah. the only discussions being really Microsoft on what they're going to buy next. Like, that's kind of the only thing that's, like, exciting to talk about, which is kind of sad. But with that being the only talk uh, about with getting excited for Microsoft and another year going by, I've I've been a fan, like, giving them money and things since 2013. So, like, since I could afford money and buy things myself. Right. Ever since then, it's really the, the zeitgeist around Xbox has been, well, you'll get the game soon. And it's been, uh, it's been almost 10 years and it's it, we've gotten a couple of games, but we have not gotten, I would say, a PlayStation esque year yet. We have not gotten like a holy shit. Xbox was way better this year than anything else. Whereas PlayStation, I can point to like almost three years since then, probably that PlayStation has basically won the year. What do you think about Microsoft's kind of outlook on the industry right now? Uh, they were in the news actually recently because uh, their sales are down. Uh, for the quarter uh, first time in I believe three quarters they were of course they they did some flowery lettering but they were they were down uh, but what do you think right I think that the main issue that Microsoft has current has had has currently and will continue or at least needs to work on needs to figure out is this whole management aspect mm. is that they continue to gain more and more studios and as they gain more, it'll be, become more difficult for them to manage them all. And we see, like, there's so many studios, and this is something Colin repeats often. I think he's right, is that if they can get their ducks in a row with these studios, they can have a major release, like, once every other month. Like, maybe even more than that. They have such an insane amount, but they can be constantly hitting with, like, top-tier content. But... As of right now, like you said, it's just like Xbox fans have been like trained to wait and we wait have. and wait. And we, then I keep telling yeah, myself next year is the year. And I told myself this year, I'm like, all right, next year is going to be great. Mm-hmm. Been doing that well, for almost eight years now. That management aspect, I mean, goes beyond it. Not to fully repeat myself, but I mean, Halo Infinite is and 343 as a studio has been what I would consider almost an in, like a failure. Yeah, say it. From yeah, it, I definitely agree. Ten year, and dude, it's uh, like I was, I was there. I bought Master Chief Collection Me day too. one. Me I was too. So excited. Yep. Only to have major disappointment. Halo Four was not 
great, but not bad. But you know, you kind of give him a pass. It was for like that it first. was like Force Awakens. You're like, all right, I'll see like, what's okay. coming next. Okay, this wasn't terrible. Yeah. Oh, five. Oh, mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Well. Yeah, and then five is just I I replayed five last year before. Oh, I'm so out. sorry. Are you okay? Oh yeah. You was, right. Uh, worse than I remembered. Yeah, no, it's it, no. it's somehow worse. I, it really is astonishing. Like I, I remember replaying it. Uh, to um, I don't remember the reason. I think I was just replaying it because I was bored like two years ago or something. And yeah, right. it is, it is as bad or worse than you remember. I remember being like, oh, that's right. Like this whole like plot is just gone halfway through the game. <laughs> like it just doesn't make any sense. Like halfway through. Oh god. And there's like. <laughs> six characters that they never touch on they're just in the background what the fuck is going on uh, it's not important but but yeah um yeah halo infinite being a major disappointment i i was right there on master chief collection as well me and um my regular co-host on the show alex bought it day one went to play it didn't work couldn't couldn't play it so that was uh and that's halo like that's like if that's for people who maybe not understand that's like if playstation released all three God of Wars and they just didn't work or something or like all three Uncharted. Yeah. The night nice, that's like if the Nathan Drake collection just came out and was like, oh, you can't play it for like two weeks. Yep. Yeah, can't it's play it for two uh, well, weeks. It's like what? They, Sony kind of had something happen to them that was similar when SOCOM came out for PlayStation Three. Oh wow! And then the network died. That's true. Uh, oh my god, I forgot all about that. And Drive Club was kind of a, a similar situation. Oh like, yeah, Drive yeah. Club, man, what a disaster! Wow, that was one thing that um that uh I remember back then. Of course, I was younger, so y- y- I was a little more fanboy back then. But I was like, oh my god, yeah. Yeah, finally they get a taste of what it's like. His drive yeah. club was one of the things I was like, "How does it feel?" All right, <laughs> fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was no good. I mean, and I mean, Sony. That and I think that's kind of shows a little bit of the the difference in management is that yeah, they they both went and got fixed, but Sony cleaned house afterwards yeah. and was like, "No, we're not dealing with this ever again." And closed down uh, studios. 343 three, i don't they went on to do well i guess it was which was first master chief collection or halo 5 i think master, uh, chief, master chief was the year before then halo 5 oh, came out right yeah or is that so, opposite um I don't know. what yeah it's not important but either uh, way but they didn't go and make a lot of necessary changes i think at 343 three, no and now we're dealing with um whatever halo infinite is now no they didn't and I would love to see what that looks like. Like, what what does it look like when when Microsoft goes like, "Hey, we should probably fix this." And I had that backwards. So it was uh, 2014 was Master Chief, Halo Five was 2015. So I had that backwards. They're almost oh, a year okay. apart from each other, perfectly. Yeah. But yeah, kind of yeah. Putting wrapping that up. Yeah, I I really don't understand what's going on over there. I'd love to know. It seems like they have a checkbook and they're just fucking ripping that thing out like here you go here you go yeah. game pass what's well, that no problem here's that i wonder what the what's gonna be the uh holiday game now since we don't have anything what's game what's coming to game pass i'm very curious we'll we'll find out for sure um going back to subscription services just for a second because we, we we went on an entire right there um yeah going back to the landscape what do you think it looks like in five years after this and then uh i'll have something to kind of put us in a bow tie for the whole episode after that but after after that uh, full conversation we had with my, uh, Microsoft kind of being in the low end and then being in the front runner in terms of having their base familiar with a streaming service, not necessarily making a tons of money off it, but they are at least in front in terms of people understanding, oh, I have an Xbox, well, I need Game Pass. That's kind of the overall sentiment that I think most people have about Xbox. What do you think the industry looks like in about five, ten years? Yeah, I feel like right now it's there's a lot of like question marks for me that once i know this then i think we can kind of more accurately predict okay from the playstation side i feel like everything on ps5 has been very good to great Mm. uh but sometimes specifically i'm thinking of the two the two main games that come to mind right now are the new ratchet and clank and horizon forbidden west right these were both uh, great games, but I don't know if they moved the needle at all. Whereas you saw PlayStation last generation, 
in like banger after banger with new IP um, or revitalized franchise, whether you think of the first horizon or you think of God of War, um, Bloodborne, stuff like that, like just consistently. And then, I mean, uh, Ghost of Tsushima, Last of Us Part Two. these were like huge, huge, huge games that made it clearly obvious this is why you want to play on PlayStation. And also to continue to kind of tie this into subscriptions, why we won't put our stuff on subscription. It's that good that you will pay full price for it. And so now uh, with PlayStation 5, we've kind of gotten these good sequels, but not necessarily as revolutionary or as amazing as the one that came before it. And I don't think the PlayStation's in, in trouble or anything like that. They definitely but aren't, I, especially with their sales. <laughs> right. But I think there's something to be said that they haven't necessarily had like an insane title for PlayStation 5, really, that kind of like shakes everything up as far as like an industry perspective. Now, we so we've taken we've gotten a lot of shit on sacred symbols about how we are a bit trepidatious towards the new God of War. But I really feel like a lot is riding on God of War that if it, it needs to be more than just more of the 20, 2018 God of War, it really needs to kind of up the ante. And then especially as we kind of move into the PlayStation 5 only era, because if people start to not feel like they're getting that like premiere experience from Sony first party, mm. people are going to start being like, well, why aren't we should put these games on the subscription service, right? Why aren't you doing what Xbox does? You know, it's it's got to it's almost like they have to be extra worth it compared to the to, to the competition in a lot of ways. And the so on the Xbox side, as far as like where I see things going is that it's really one of two ways. If they can get that management down, like I mentioned, Xbox is going to be a juggernaut, like insane. If they can have hit after hit multiple times a year. It'll be insane. It'll be crazy. And I mean, with Activision and Blizzard in the mix, uh, I don't know if how many of those will be exclusive, but just think about it from a Game Pass perspective. That's a ton of value and content to put on that service that just makes it that much more appealing. So on the other hand, if they can't get their studios managed properly, then they're just continually going to disappoint even their most hardcore fan base. And that's that's a problem. So I feel like right now, even though we're a few years into this generation, we're still kind of at a crossroads for where things are going to go based on how the next 8 to 12 months works out. Okay, so you mentioned God of War Ragnarok. It needing to be different. And, and I think a lot of people, I think, on kind of the internet, or I guess you could say in the industry side of the internet or something, are... I think agreeing with you for the most part and saying like, yeah, it does. It doesn't need to be somewhat different. I do feel like a lot of people are having issues and I really do think that's why they didn't show that much of the game when they announced the release date. I really think they were like, we need to make sure this is like polished and ready to go. Cause we do not want why are the boat animations thing, this like the same argument come up again. So what does a, what does Ragnarok need to do? For in your mind to be like, okay, this is this is a PS4 generation. This is gonna be a great start, or I guess really a mid cycle kind of thing. And eh, it's not really mid. We're kind of like in a weird spot in the generation. But what does it have to nail for that to be like? Oh, this was this was what it needed to be. Yeah. So I, it's kind of a weird. I'm trying to think of how to put this because it, I don't it definitely is a weird question. So I don't blame you at all. I, I'm very oh, curious because no. I don't I don't really have an answer either. I I would be happy. Me personally, like me, would be happy with 2018 God of War because I loved that game. But is that what PlayStation needs right now? I don't I don't know. I don't I don't think so. I think they really need to blow people away with this game. I just don't know how. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it needs to be more expansive in the areas that the first game kind of was not so great. And I, that's kind of a vague term. So to elaborate a little more, I think about one of the weakest aspects of 2018 God of War to me is that it was like trying to be somewhere between a linear experience and then have like a weird, yep. not open world is not the right way to put it, but like hmm. this travel system where you go through the game. Yeah, and like so, an open sandboxy kind of, 
weird in between right. with a world type situation. They they did. Um, I hope I'm not pulling this out of my ass. I'm pretty sure they confirmed that all nine realms are in the game, which is pretty crazy. Um, yeah. Oh, that's so, so that's I crazy. Yeah. So I'm curious what that's gonna look like. Maybe that's what they're kind of. Maybe that will be a solution to your kind of needs to be more expansive thing. I I don't know. I I had issues with the um. The main game I, I really did love. The only major issues I had is uh, when you finish the game, it was kind of like, all right, go do the stuff. But like, it wasn't really made to do that because like there were whole areas that you had to you would go to like a collectible, but it wasn't accessible anymore because of an event in the story. So like you'd have to like entrance from another way, which means you have to like go around the map, the other entrance rather than this very fast way through. So there was a bunch of weird things like right. that for me, but um were there anything else other than expansive that you think that they kind of need to know i think um i think as long as they bring story chops which i don't mean to you know call it the director or anything i think i'm sure he's uh gonna do a great job especially since he has cory barlog definitely helping him but there's a new director on this so like who the hell mm -hmm. knows what this is gonna be right yeah there's definitely um you know it's it can be a little bit up in the air when you have a leadership change like that but with i think cory's still involved enough that I, think so. I feel confident in some way about that aspect of it but th that's one of the it's just one of those things where you don't want to necessarily reinvent the wheel with a sequel but at the same time you don't want to do too much of the same stuff and i think that's why uh we saw horizon kind of score slightly less than the first one is that it kind of didn't feel as fresh as it did the first time and did you agree with I, that I'm, What's that? That it that it wasn't as fresh. Did you agree with the overall yeah. sentiment? I think the, I think everyone kind of thought that. Did you agree? Yeah, I I did agree. Over. I mean, I think there was some cool like the. It's a visually like a fantastic game, and I just like a lot of the times I just felt like I was kind of playing the same game again. Oh. Like the, there wasn't necessarily that much new about. It. I mean, the story was really cool, and I like that aspect of it, but. Uh, Horizon is a game that I appreciate for like I don't necessarily love the the combat and I don't love the open world kind of Ubisoft style aspect of it but I love the story and I love the characters in the world so I don't know maybe maybe it's a me thing but so yeah it's it's something with God of War where it's like making it fresh enough but also familiar and I don't think Sony has gotten that quite right yet mm. with the sequels they've done this generation i'm famously inconsistent um <laughs> with my uh kind of judgment towards games specifically in this nature where i was happy with horizon forbidden west and i would be happy if if god of war ragnarok was a better god of war 2018 in every way but wasn't this revolutionary game but i found myself saying exactly what you're saying but with Starfield, when it was revealed, I have that's one of my this that's one of my most popular videos actually on this channel is me and um, a co-host I had brought in Emmett just shitting on Starfield because I just did mm. not like what I saw after all of that time and hype. It's Bethesda in space, but again, I find myself not really having that critique with Horizon and with God of War because I don't know maybe it's just more my type of game. But I do feel you with. The kind of like, you know, it needs to be different and stuff. But I just wanted to bring up that, like, I find it interesting that I'm inconsistent. So I'm curious if, if many other people out there are also inconsistent. Because I, I literally did the exact thing of, like, Starfield came out. And I was like, oh, this is a Bethesda game in space. Okay. Like, and it mm -hmm. seemed like a lot of other people's reaction was, holy shit, it's a Bethesda game in space. Holy, sh like, people, that was sure. the exciting aspect. Whereas that was like my... Like I thought this was well, going to yeah. be, I thought this was, I thought this was an evolution. I thought this was a Uncharted 3 to Last of Us situation. Not perfect. Mm -hmm. It would really be Uncharted 2 to Last of Us um, situation here, but we're really just getting a sequel, but in space, I feel like. Oh, yeah. I mean, the whole Starfield thing is that for Bethesda fans, I, I don't blame them for feeling the way they do about that game. Like you said, it's Bethesda in space, which is cool. Yeah, but I get for, it, for, but it's just... for Yeah, for me, it's just kind of... Fallout 4, 
I, which is a game I really liked and enjoyed, but it felt like they were kind of a little bit with um, a step behind, yeah. a step forward and a step behind at the same time. Yeah. Still had some of that stuff that you're like, wow, you haven't really modernized or the things that you did try to do new, like the settlements weren't very good. Oh, and no, so they when they come out with Starfield and they're like, oh, a thousand, whatever, thousand planets or whatever. I was like, like, I'm no. supposed to be excited about that. You guys no, no, were having no, issues yeah. with the regular game. So now I have to be like excited about a thousand planets. Oh, my yeah. God. That was very much like I feel like I felt like I was Dustin. I felt like I was going fucking crazy. I was like, no one mm -hmm. else sees this. I'm like worried about this game. Like, I don't think this is going to pan out like everyone thinks it will. I fucking hope I'm wrong. I was wrong about other games that I said the same thing. I was wrong about uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. I know it wasn't super popular among most people, but I fucking loved that game. I, I shitted on that every single time I saw it because I hated every trailer. I really thought it was corny. The UI looked terrible, but I was completely wrong and I loved that game. So I really am hoping that Starfield's going to come out. Tom Howard himself will come to my door and be like, Go fuck yourself. Here's the game. And I'm going to love it. Yeah. He says that the famous look who's laughing now. <laughs> look That's what he says look who's game. laughing now to round this out. Cause I know you have to go soon. I wanted uh, to start a uh, tradition on the show where I end the show sure. with a question. And this can be, this is broad. So ask me if you want it lowered, but what is one thing that you see in the industry that you want changed? Again, that's very broad. Let me know if you want to be narrowed it down a bit. We could talk about game journalism. We could talk about the culture of games. We could talk about the discourse of games, reviews. I could go on and on about anything. But what's one thing that if five to ten years changes drastically to something that you want to see better of? What's one thing that the gaming industry you think is doing something wrong right now and you want you want fixed or modified in some way? Hmm. I feel like I can answer this in, in multiple ways. Oh, me too. I, I could like... fucking go on. I'm very pessimistic, <laughs> especially yeah. with especially I'm very pessimistic, kind of current, but I'm very optimistic long term. I kind of I've always been that way. So I, I've, yeah. I feel the I feel you. dude. So here's the, the I'll answer this in two shorter ways. OK, the the way that I would like to see the industry change currently is just that. I'm. I don't know. The, and other people have said this, so I'm not saying anything new, but I'm concerned with this hyper fixation on everything blockchain and NFT uh -huh. related. Okay. And I know we we did an episode recently with uh, John Garvin and um, about his new game that's going to be and it like have NFT aspects. Can you of give it. me like and the TLDR of that? I have not seen it, so I can't the, relay what it was. The too long didn't read is just that. They want to, their argument is that it's a way for players to engage with the game further and mm. be able to um, take more ownership in the game itself, whether it's through getting in-game items, they're doing other stuff or earning items or being able to sell them or whatever. And the, the, I throw up the red flags to that just in that Gaming hasn't had its purity for a long time. We're long gone from the days where you buy a game, you put it in your system and you play it. And then when you're done, you can say you had a great time. We're long past that, right? With the age of DLC and subscriptions. And I'm not saying those are all bad or anything like that, but obviously it has changed, right? And so I guess I'm just hesitant to add something called play to earn or something <laughs> like that. It's just like... Let's let's maybe take off the the money, the dollar sign eyes for a moment and just think about why people love this hobby. Yeah. And so that's that's the one aspect. The other aspect that I'll just say briefly is just that. From a community standpoint, I just am so surprised at the level of a uh, console wars stuff that's still out there that people I, I, I know that something happens for us a lot with sacred symbols is that. There's people that use our content uh, as like bottom. I call it I call it in our personal discord channel. And like when I talk to the other guys, I'm like, it's bottom feeder content yeah. is that yeah. we say something on the show. And then so someone goes and makes a video about it, about how either stupid they think we are or something like that. And I'm like, come up with your own opinion that's worthwhile and make content about that. Like, 
who cares? Like, why? Why would you like? Who cares what you think about we what we said about a video game? It's like so many layers. Oh of yeah. Meta oh yeah. Of the conversation. That's like eight. That's like a fucking onion. Like you're you're yeah. you're debating about a niche hobby that is about a niche system about three guys that are having their own opinions. Very interesting. Right. I've seen it, this too. Like, He's not making this up, ladies and gentlemen. Like. People yeah, make this content that's centered around shitting on the other systems. And I really, I really can't imagine that headspace. I, I imagine these people are, I, I don't want to be mean here, but I imagine these people are sad or something. I don't know. Maybe they're, <laughs> they're something unfulfilling, but I've seen, I've seen what you're talking about on Twitter. Um, I don't, I'm not touching that stuff on YouTube because YouTube will be like, oh, here's the garbage train coming. <laughs> so I right. can't touch that stuff on YouTube. But on Twitter, I'll see it every now and then. And I'm like, what? What is this? I remember being, um, I remember I thought I was naive as fuck. Like 20, I want to say like eh, 2017 to 2019 ish era, being like, I kind of thought it was over. I really did. I, I didn't think really it was a big deal anymore. And I feel like, Twitter slowly kind of like cultivated this, I guess, hate culture. I don't know. Or maybe, or maybe just super love culture. Maybe they're just super hardcore to it. But I really, I really don't know what the hell all that's about. Yeah. I think that now that Xbox is competing on a much higher level, that it's kind of rebirthed some of that. And I'm not saying it's just Xbox fans. I think that it's, because it's the Xbox fans are out fighting, the PlayStation fans are like, well, some of the fanboys or whatever are out to fight, too. And it's like, that's one thing. If I'm proud of anything with sacred symbols is that I really do feel like we try to be as fair as possible, where we will be like, yeah, Xbox was right about smart delivery. Xbox isn't nickeling and diming their customers. And like we it's funny that people will be like i'm never i see on twitter people like oh i'm not listening to sacred symbols the fanboy crap and i'm like we shit on sony more than anybody yeah more than anybody yeah and so i don't know i think that people need just need to be more honest more analytical and it's okay these are just they're really just toys when they it comes are down to it the yeah. adult toys that we play not that kind of adult toy oh, but you know what i mean we adult talked about toys it earlier. that we play with and uh yeah, so everyone just needs to take it easy. Take it easy, everybody. That's straight from Dustin Furman himself. Blockchain fandom. Those are the two things that you like to change. I, you know what? I'm right there with you. I, I never, as soon as I, as soon as a man that wants to make money says he will help me make money, I immediately go, there's bullshit somewhere around this. Mm. <laughs> I really doubt yeah. that you're worried about me not making money here. So uh, let's back this up. And yeah, play to earn. I, I can't remember who said this for the life of me, but, um, I can't. It was someone I, I hosted somebody on the show. Uh, it's not important, but they were basically like, um, uh, yeah, playing games like that. That's how I want to make money is is just playing a game, earning things and selling it. And also, it's always interesting that we've already been doing this. Um, I was never in the scene, but I always I remember seeing um when I was first getting into like watching Twitch streams and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Counter Strike Go. I'm pretty sure oh, that's yeah. the one that you can sell stuff on it, right? And right. like World of Warcraft, you can do that too. So I was like, we, I mean, people are already kind of doing this. So I was confused on that too. But I guess now you'll earn it or at least be able to own it via a unique ID. I don't know. But I, I very much agree with the, the fandom notion. I think, I think your, your guys' route in Sacred Symbols is the one that will ultimately win the discourse or whatever you want to call this where you really do just take facts on the face. You don't really wrap it in anything. I think we all have biases that you can't really control, and even subconsciously yeah. you don't know you're even doing it. But the littlest of nitpicks at that point, I think, is being brought up. At, but I think you guys are doing it probably probably the best out there, and I, I really do think. And I think that shows in uh, being the number one gaming patron in the world. Yeah, man, it's amazing uh, what not telling what your audience what to think and fucking crazy them they don't constantly it's amazing what that will do for your platform is just being decent to your audience but how dare you not vote for the person man. i want you to what the fuck is wrong with you <laughs> exactly man interesting it's crazy yeah so dustin i know you gotta go so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go this was a great conversation we nailed a bunch of things that i wanted to talk about so thank you so much for, first off, donating your time thank you for coming on and again yeah. congratulations with the success that you found yourself man this is great 
Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Best of luck to you with uh, this endeavor. I think you said this is kind of like a, a newer thing that you're doing, so, right? Or is it your host is kind of uh, like out for a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my normal show is the Easy Trivies Game Podcast. We just do gaming news, general gaming news. I go on research stuff. I write up a docket and cover it on the show. Sometimes it's an hour and a half. Sometimes it's two hours. But that's the normal show. Of course, you have sacred symbols. So what did I want to do? I wanted to bring you on. I wanted to just give you a full-on interview. I just wanted to talk to you. And um, there will be... Uh, I should have said this at the beginning. If you're here for the regular scheduled Friday Easy Achievers podcast, that will still be there. I'll record that tomorrow as of recording. So that's being recorded Thursday. So don't worry about that. The regular stuff's coming. But I did want to do this. I've always wanted to do an interview-esque type of show because there's just so many people I want to talk to. And I just wanted to bring you on because uh, you were literally the first person I have invited and you said yes and I couldn't fucking believe it. I was like, whoa, what? Oh, yeah, dude. I was like, yeah, <laughs> fuck yeah. You you emailed me back and I was like, I looked over to my phone was like, he fucking emailed me back. Dude, you have no idea how many people just ignore you. So I was like, what yeah. the fuck? <laughs> I, I always try to at least email back. Sometimes like I, I haven't done one of these in a while because mm. I did a bunch in a row and you kind of get burnt out on, I imagine on doing that. And you have so, a full fucking job so yeah, yeah i imagine it's hard yeah so you hit me at the right time so Perfect. Uh, i'm glad glad we could do this thank you for having me it's much appreciated of course. thank you so much for joining us for this week's easy achiever i i don't know thank you so much remember go achieve